right, gang, we're going to start in on chapter 10. So in chapter 10, we're going to continue with hypothesis testing, but instead of one sample, like we saw in chapter 9, we're going to bump up to two samples. So chapter 8 was one sample confidence intervals, chapter 9 was one sample hypothesis tests, and now we're going to move up to two sample hypothesis tests. And you could do two sample confidence intervals also. You've got those calculator buttons there for you. Your book doesn't really go through them. We'll kind of talk about them vaguely a little bit. I just, I do want you to hear that those are options. So we're gonna conduct and interpret hypothesis tests for means, for proportions, and then matched pairs, okay? Or we could say matched, or you could say pairs, or you could even say matched pairs. So we're gonna take a look at that. Um, when we get to mean land, I know they're on the first and third um, outcome here, but when we say two population means, this will be the independent samples, and these are going to be the paired samples. We're in, when we're in proportion land, we're only going to have independent samples, so we won't have to worry about making that distinction in proportion land. So when you have two independent population proportions, here's going to be your null. It's going to be slightly different from Chapter 9. And why I say slightly different is because in Chapter 9, we had the format where P would equal some kind of number, and I'm just gonna write 70% there just for example. So where it changes when you move from chapter nine to 10, the number goes away. So we're gonna just assume the two population proportions are equal to one another, and just take note that there's no number in here, right? Here we had 70%. We always had that number back in chapter nine. We don't have that in chapter 10. So we're just gonna assume equality of the two population proportions. All right, so that's our first distinction when we're going through two sample land. Um, the other big one is this giant beast of a test statistic. So this is just a good time, right? We have the difference in proportions here, at least the difference in sample proportions, the difference in population proportions, and this is a standard error. And I want to take note, there's a lot going on here. This is P prime of one, right? So this is the sample proportion from your first treatment group or your first sample. This is the sample proportion from your second treatment group. This is the hypothesized proportion of your first treatment or first sample, hypothesized proportion of your second sample or second population, excuse me. P sub C down here is a whole other number. And I will talk about that when we get towards the bottom of the page, but I want you to notice there's a subscript of C on all of these where this is a one and this is a two, one and a two. So you actually have five numbers you're managing in here. It can be a lot. All right, so we'll, we'll fill this in, but like always, this is gonna be step nine. In terms of your alternate, if I just move this up quite a bit, all right, in terms of our alternate, it's got the same setup as chapter nine. Whatever P1 and P2 are, you're gonna leave them in your alternate and the symbol is gonna change. And again, we either have a right-tailed, a left-tailed, or two-tailed test. All right, so we could call these one-sided. Right, this is our two-sided test, I should say a one-sided test. All right, this one here is equivalent to a confidence interval. All so long as your alpha level on your hypothesis test and your confidence level add up to 100%. We're gonna find p-values the exact same way we did in chapter nine. We will use normal CDF to calculate the area under the standard normal curve, either right of your test statistic from chapter 10, left of your test statistic from, not from chapter 10, from step 10. So let me repeat that. We're gonna find the area under the curve, right of the calculated test statistic in step 10, uh, if you have a greater than alternate, left of the calculated test statistic in step 10, if you have a less than, and then that not equals two was always a little funky, right? If our number in step 10 was positive, I was gonna get the right tail and double it for symmetry because I have both tails here. If my z-score from step 10 was negative, I was gonna find the left tail and double it for symmetry. All right, now our assumptions get that much more convoluted as we move into two sample land. And, and two sample proportion has 
the trickiest assumptions to check. They take the longest time, so just, just get ready. So we're either gonna have randomly selected samples, plural, or our samples will represent our population, or treatments will be randomly assigned. So one of those three things would need to happen, and that will create independent samples for us, okay? And then, for normality, you have four things to check. You have N1, P1 prime, N1, 1 minus P1 prime, N2, P2 prime, N2, 1 minus P2 prime. So you need at least 10 successes and 10 failures in your first sample, and you need at least 10 successes and 10 failures in your second sample. And where this is different from chapter nine, I'm gonna just remind you, in chapter nine we did NP greater than or equal to 10 and N1 minus P greater than or equal to 10. And I wanna be clear, back in chapter nine, we pulled this P from the null hypothesis. Well, the reason it's different here, why it has the sample proportion and not the null proportion, is because if we look at our null proportion, there is no number in our null proportion. Right? I had just mentioned that, there's no number here so there's nothing for me to plug in. I couldn't do NP1 because I don't know what it is. So we use the next best thing, we use the statistic. So we need 10 successes, 10 failures in our first sample, 10 successes, 10 failures in our second sample, and we're good to go. Um, your book actually sets this number at five. All right, it, it needs the number of successes and failures to be at five. Most statisticians use 10. Your book decided to use five. They're being a little, little loose with the normality, but hey, good for them. And then, again, we need our sample sizes are small relative to our population size so that we can sample without replacement, okay? All right, so as we get towards the bottom of this, we're gonna introduce this new number, P sub C, and this is gonna show up in steps nine and 10. And P sub C is the pulled or I should say the combined population proportions. So we're gonna take the total number of successes between the two samples and divide that by the total number of observations between the two samples. And I think it's easier to just um, take in the words of the numerator and denominator. If that works for you when we get going, great. And if it doesn't, you can always use the formula. You can sit there and calculate N1, P1 prime and add to it N2, P2 prime. But I think it's easier to just use the words to get to this number. Um, but see what you prefer. And then like always, we've got to make our decision. Are we going to reject or are we going to fail to reject? So I'm going to review the 13 steps on the next page, and then we're going to get going on our first hypothesis test. Okay, we're back with our, our 13 steps that we saw in chapter nine. So you're going to define a parameter, but this time you can notice I have plural. So you're going to have to define P1 and P2. So you're gonna owe me two parameters to define now that we're in chapter 10. Um, you're gonna state your null and your alternate. We know about our alpha, right? If, we don't, if I'm not giving you an alpha default to 5%, we're gonna check our assumptions. We'll state the distribution. And again, in this chapter, you will either be on the Z or T distribution. Once we leave chapter 10, we are gonna to add to it. We'll add chi-squareds or F, but for chapters eight, nine, and 10, it's always Z or T. We're in mean land or proportion land. You're gonna state the name of the test, all right? Degrees of freedom, I say if applicable, and again, in proportion land, they aren't applicable. We don't have any um, in proportion land. You're gonna give me your test statistic as a formula, your test statistic with your numbers plugged in. You're gonna get me a p-value, which is a number between zero and one. You will draw me a picture, and then you're gonna state your conclusion, right? Your first sentence will always be, do you reject or fail to reject the null? And then after that, does that mean you have evidence or you do not have evidence, or I should say sufficient evidence for the alternate? When it comes to drawing that picture, we have the same protocol that we did in chapter uh, nine. So we're gonna be looking at, oops, let me get this a little bit more straight, there we go. Okay, so if you have a two-tailed test, well, you can't see that label. I am on fire right now. Let me move that down. There we go. All right, if you have a two-tailed or two-sided test, make sure you shade both sides, right? If your p-value, excuse me, if your test statistic is positive, find the right tail, double it for symmetry. If your test statistic is negative, find the left tail and then double it for symmetry. 
right? You've got a left tail test and a right tail test. So those are the three types of graphs that you might be giving me in chapter 10. Okay, so with that, we're gonna start our first hypothesis test. I'll see you in a bit, bye. Okay gang, let's do it. Let's run our first two sample hypothesis test. So as I read this, just be on the listen for what land are we in? Are we in mean land? Are we in proportion land? Or you can ask, do I have a numerical variable or a categorical variable? All right, so some people seem to believe that you can fix anything with duct tape. Even so, many were skeptical when researchers announced that duct tape may be, more, may, may be a more effective and less painful alternative to liquid nitrogen, which doctors routinely use to freeze warts. A study was conducted at the Madigan Army Medical Center where patients with warts were randomly assigned to either the duct tape treatment or the more traditional freezing treatment. Those in the duct tape group wore duct tape over the wart for six days, then removed the tape, soaked the area in water, and used an emery board to scrape the area. This process was repeated for a maximum of two months or until the wart was gone. Data consistent with the values in the study are summarized in the following table. Okay, so I see that I've got some warts. I had 100 of them and it looks like 60 were su successfully removed in the nitrogen group. And then in the duct tape group, it looks like I had 104 warts and 88 uh, of those warts were successfully removed. All right, do the data suggest that freezing is less successful than duct tape in removing warts? Let the level of significance be 1%. All right, so I'm gonna have to run a hypothesis test because they're looking for evidence, right? They wanna say, does the data suggest this? And we gotta figure out what land we are in. So in terms of my variable, all right, let's go to my sample size or my sample, at least in this first group, it's, it's, this is the number of warts that were getting treated with liquid nitrogen. So what was I keeping track of? I was keeping track of, yes, they were successfully removed, or no, they were not successfully removed, right? So it was one or the other, yes or no, which is a categorical variable, right? So that puts me in proportion land, and basically I'm keeping track of that frequency count, how many warts were actually removed. So it, it says here number with a wart successfully removed, and this can be a little confusing because you might say, well, if it's got number in it, it's a numerical variable, but this is a frequency count. You can hear the proportion, it's 60 out of 100, right? 88 out of 104. So yes, I, I'm with you that this is a number, but this is a frequency count, and we've always been taking frequencies and writing them as relative frequencies. So we are in proportion land, and I think you can hear we have two groups, right? We have the freezing group and the duct tape group. And if you're not sure what this is, I, I looked into this because my brother used to get warts and he used to have them frozen off, and he said it was super painful. He'd get them all over his arm. So I, I looked into this alternate treatment and duct tape is the way to go, but it just didn't sound that much better, right? To wear duct tape for six days, soak it in water and use an emery board. And if you're not sure what an emery board is, it's basically like one of those nail files. So to just kind of scrape it down, blah, that sounded awful too. But here we are. All right, so this time we have, we have two groups, right? We have two samples, if you will, two treatment groups, however you want to write it. So I could say there's two samples or you could say two treatment groups. And these are independent samples, which they always will be in proportion land, but the number of warts that we remove with nitrogen are gonna have nothing to do with the number of warts removed by duct tape. Those are completely independent of each other. Okay, and because I'm in proportion land, I know I'm gonna be using a z-test statistic. So you're starting to see that my little scribbles on the margins are getting a lot, lot larger. And just to give me some context, let's find the sample proportions here. So I'll call the first group the nitrogen group. It looks like they had 60 successfully removed out of 100. So they had about a 60% success rate, okay. Let's see what was going on with the duct tape group. What was their sample proportion? It looks like we've got 88 out of 104. Let me go grab my calculator and see what that is. So we got 88 out of 104. We're looking at about 85%. I'm just gonna round it to two decimals and put that it's about 85%. So just based on statistics, right? These are not parameters at all. To me, it does look like there might be some evidence that duct tape is more effective than um, 
than nitrogen in removing warts because it's got such a higher success rate. But let's go see what the Z-score is and get all of that um, under our belt. But I just wanna be clear, all the stuff in here, this is all of my statistics, statistics. Okay, sometimes I have trouble remembering how to spell. So these are my statistics. I will not use these numbers until step 10. Well, actually, JK, in, in two sample land, you will use these in your assumptions. I forgot, changes a little bit from one sample to two sample land. All right, so with that, let's start running this hypothesis test. So step one is gonna be to define those parameters. And I say parameters plural because I have two proportions that I'm gonna balance out. So I'm gonna scooch this up so that I have some room to begin my hypothesis right up. All right, so here we go. So in terms of step one, do I wanna write mu's or do I wanna write p's? Well, I have two p's to write. So I have p1 is the true proportion. And in this case, we're looking for the true proportion of warts successfully removed by liquid nitrogen freezing. Okay, and P sub two, I'm gonna use a bunch of quote marks because I'm lazy and I don't wanna write this all over again, but this would be the true proportion of warts successfully removed by, and this time it would be the duct tape group. Okay, so those are the two treatments I'm comparing, right? Duct tape and liquid nitrogen freezing. Okay, so steps two and three are gonna be my null and alternate. They go together. All right, so for your null hypothesis, this was stated on the first page, but when you're in two sample land, it will always be P sub one equals P sub two. All right, and then for the alternate, we're gonna decide which symbol we're gonna use based on the wording of the problem. And if there is no slant one way or the other, we'll, we'll go with the not equals two test, but let's see if we can find a slant. All right, so we've got our null P sub one equals P sub two. Right? No method, no treatment method is better than the other. Right? Status quo, no reason to go duct tape. We can just stick with good old nitrogen free freezing if we fail to reject the null. All right, it says, do the data suggest that freezing is less successful? So if I have freezing defined as P sub one, I would have a less than alternate. And this question naturally comes up and it's a great one. Some students will ask, well, what if I define P sub one to be the duct tape group and P sub two is the freezing group? What if these were switched? Well, if these were switched, then you would have a greater than alternate. And that would change a little bit of your hypothesis test write up, but it would not change your conclusion. Ultimately, whether you have P one in the freezing group or P two in the, uh, and P two in the duct tape group or vice versa, we should all reach the same conclusion. There's either evidence that freezing is less successful or there's not. All right, so step four is gonna be our alpha. I did give you an alpha, I set alpha to 1%. So we lowered the probability of that type one error from 5% to 1% from the industry standard to 1%. Um, a consequence would be that beta is a little higher. We might be more likely to make a type two error, but that's okay. All right, assumptions. So assumptions is always the big one. It's the biggest one, I should say, when you're doing two sample proportions. Okay, so as we go through this, let's see what we got. The first thing we have to figure out is do we have random assignment of treatments, random samples, samples representing our population? So here are our options. We have randomly selected samples, samples representing populations or treatments are randomly assigned. So let's see if we have any of those. So if I looked at this, I see right here the phrase randomly assigned. So oh, you can't see what I was just underlining, excuse me. I went back up to my original wording in my problem and I see the phrase randomly assigned. All right, so let me scoot this back up so I have room to write all of this. All right, so we've got the treatments were randomly assigned, and that's what I'm gonna put in for my first assumption. Treatments, randomly assigned. Okay, so this wasn't a case of where I had two random samples. 
it just, they took the, the folks in the experiment and they randomly assigned them to treatments. Okay, so with that, let's see what the next one is. Um, I, I do have independent samples. We always will in proportion land. We're not gonna do the paired versus independent in proportion land. But I do wanna state, yes, I have independent samples. The number of warts successfully removed by liquid nitrogen should have no effect on the number of warts successfully removed by duct tape. All right, the normality assumption. This is the one that's gonna take the most time and effort. We need, in the first treatment group, at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. And then in the second treatment group, we also need at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. So let's see what we've got. So I need to check N1, P1 prime. I need to check N1 times its complement, one minus P1 prime. I also need to check N2, oops, N2, P2 prime. And N2 against its complement. Right, so you can see there is a lot to check when you're, when you're running this. So, Let's start plugging in these numbers. In my first group, I had 100 warts, right? And there was that 60% success rate. So that means I had 60 warts successfully removed. I'll put a little check mark there. All right, on the flip of that, on the complement, I had 40 warts that were not successfully removed. Ooh, I'm gonna really jam myself up here. Uh, let me erase some of this because that is so cramped. All right, so in my first treatment group of nitrogen, I had 60 successes, so by complement I had 40 failures, which is great, I had at least 10 in each. All right, let's take a look at the duct tape group. So let's try N2, P2 prime. So I had 104, all right, 104 warts and a success rate of about 85%. Now keep in mind, I had rounded this number, all right? When we were on our calculator, I rounded it. If you keep it exact, and you do 104 times this exact decimal, you're gonna get back to 88 because that's how many successes you had in that, for, or excuse me, in that second treatment group. I had 88 warts successfully removed. That was greater than or equal to 10. And we'll do N2, one minus P2 prime. So we'll go 104 times one minus this rounded 85%. And if I, if I take a look at that, we know that's gonna be 16 because that's gonna be the complement to this 88. And if you're thinking like, where on earth are you getting 16? Well, if you had 104 warts in total and 88 were successful, then you know that 16 were not successful, right? So I had 88 successes, 16 failures in that second group, okay? All right, our tried and true option or, um, Assumption number four, right, are the sample sizes small relative to the population? We can multiply these numbers by 10, right? We have 1,000 and then we have 1,040. And I'm going to make the assumption that there are more than 1,000 warts out there that can get um, treated with liquid nitrogen and more than 1,040 warts out there that can get treated with duct tape. So I'm going to say my sample sizes are small relative to my population. All right, so I'm through my assumptions, and I'm specifically through that deal breaker assumption, okay? I'm on the sampling distribution for proportions, or I should say sampling distribution for difference of proportions, and it's approximately normal. So I have normal CDF that I'm allowed to use. All right, so let me move this up some more, and let's keep going with this. So step six was stating the name of your distribution. So step six here, I'm gonna use the Z distribution. All right, you will always use the Z distribution if you're in proportion land. For step seven, right, it's number of, it's state the name of the test. So we have number of samples, what land you're in, what letter you're using. So I have two samples. I'm in proportion land and I'm gonna run a Z hypothesis test. All right, step eight was degrees of freedom and there are never any degrees of freedom in prop land. It's not applicable. 
it's the only land where it's not applicable. Every other land, we're going to have some degrees of freedom. All right, so the next step is to write your test statistic. And we have that really funky formula. It is long. There is no denying it. We have this beast here. So I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to copy this onto my, uh, my write-up in example one. And then we're going to talk about what numbers we're going to plug in. And we're finally going to get, we're going to circle back to that P sub C in just a moment. Okay. So here we go. So my Z score is always going to be a statistic minus a parameter over a standard error. So take a moment and get that down. I know that's a lot, but let's talk one piece at a time about how we're going to plug in for this. And similarly, with all the hypothesis tests we did in chapter nine, I'm going to flip over to my calculator in a bit to help me actually get this number because I, I don't want to. I don't want to get it on my own. I want my calculator to assist me. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to plug in for each of these. For the sample proportion from the nitrogen group, we knew this number was 60%. We knew this number was about 85%. Okay. Now, P1 minus P2, I want us to think about what this would mean if the null was true. And that's the thing that we're assuming is true, right? So let me just do a little work on the side here, and I'm going to wind up erasing it. But we know P1 is supposed to equal P2. That's what the null is saying, and we assume the null is true. Well, imagine you used some algebra and moved this P2 over to the left side. If I subtracted P2, and let me not skip a step, I'll actually just write it out. All right, if I subtract P2 from both sides, right, I would have H not being P1 minus P2 on the left side equaling zero. Right, so if I subtract P2 to the left side of the equation, I move it over here, then this difference is zero. And again, if the null is true, if there's no difference in these proportions, right? If, if removing warts via freezing is as successful as removing warts via duct tape, then the difference between these success rates should be zero. So if the null is true, this difference should be zero. So I want you to keep that in mind. So far we know 60%, 85%, and if the null is true, this difference is zero. There's no difference in proportions or proportions of warts successfully removed between the two treatment methods. All right, you know N1 down here is 100. You know N2 is 104. And now we got to have a talk about P sub C. Okay, so let me erase this because I'm going to be putting some numbers there. So I want to go into what the combined proportion of successes is. I'm going to scribble it over here and talk about P sub C. So this is your overall success rate between the two samples, we're going to pool our data. We're going to combine it. So what that means is if you look between the two samples, overall, you successfully removed 148 warts. 60 were from the nitrogen group and 88 were from the duct tape group. But overall, if you added those two numbers, right, you know your numerator here, your overall number of warts, your number of successes combined was 148. All right, now out of how many warts in general? Well, we had 100 from the first sample, or 100 from the first treatment group, 104 from the second treatment group. So we had 204 warts that we were attempting to remove. So in general, 148 divided by 204, we're looking at about 73%. And it should be a number between your first samples proportion and your second samples proportion, right? Our first success rate was 60% from the nitrogen group, 85% for the duct tape group, and 73% somewhere in the middle of that. So your combined proportion should be somewhere in the middle of this. Okay, so that's P sub C. So with all of that, let me write up the formula for step 10 with my numbers plugged in, all right? And then we're gonna see what our calculator can help us with. So we have, man, I can't write today. I'm just trying to make a fraction bar. 
Okay, so we had our sample proportion at 60%, our second sample proportion at 85%, and if the null is true, the difference in the parameters is zero. For my standard error in that denominator, we had 73 times its complement over N1. I had 73 times its complement over N2. All right, so it's at this point, I'm gonna pause for a moment, I'm gonna flip to my calculator and I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna use my calculator to help me get step 10, the rest of step 10, step 11, and step 12, and then I'll flip back to here and we'll work on our write-up. All right, see you in a bit, bye. Hey Math 43, let's take a look at how we can run this hypothesis test on our calculators. And, and again, I really wanna encourage you to run the hypothesis test on your calculator first, and then use that calculator output screen to help you with your write-up. So if I head over here, let me go back to my home screen. I'll clear this out just to start it. Um, we're gonna go over to stat and tests. And again, all of your hypothesis tests, or most of them, when we get to the later chapters, they're a little further down, but most of your hypothesis tests that we're gonna use are in this first screen. So we're now heading into chapter 10, so we've got the two samples. So you'll always see the twos denoted here. And we're in proportion land, so we're gonna use option six. Okay, and so th this is our, our screen that we gotta fill in. And these first four entries have to be whole numbers. So you can't put in proportions, they need to be whole numbers. So what I mean by that is in my liquid nitrogen group, um, we had 60 warts successfully removed, right? but that was out of 100. And in the second group, in the duct tape group, we had 88 warts successfully removed, and that was out of 104. All right, so those first four numbers have to be whole numbers, otherwise it'll pop back in error. All right, now let's take a look. It looks like we had a less than alternative. So let me go highlight less than over here. And then like always, you have a couple of options. You can hit calculate, or you can hit draw. We're gonna hit calculate. Right? And if you look, there's tons of information that comes your way. Here is your z-score. So right there is step 10. Right? The one right under it is your p-value, and that's step 11. And again, be careful. Your p-value is a probability. So it's definitely a number between zero and one. So don't tell me the probability is 4.1. Don't forget this e to the negative five over here. Here you can see your sample one's proportion of successes, right? Sample two proportion of successes. This P without the subscript on it, there's P sub C, right? So we've got P1 hat, P2 hat, excuse me, your calculator says hat. Um, in, in your book, we've been using primes. So P1 prime, P2 prime, P sub C, right? And then just at the bottom here, they'll give you your sample sizes. All right, so now we can also click back through this and let's try the draw option this time. All right, and it's gonna draw my standard normal curve, and I don't really have much of a p-value, right? They're even rounding it on the screen to zero. And my z-score is, well, it's pretty off, far off to the left here, right? Because this is negative one, negative two, negative three would be around here, so negative 3.9 would be off of the view that I have in this screen. And, and there's step 11 for you. So from your calculator, ooh, actually I think this is step 12, my bad. So, so from your calculator, you can get steps 10, 11, and 12 directly. And then from that output screen, and let me just review it real quick. If we just go ahead and hit calculate, right? There are those three main proportions that you need, P1 prime, P2 prime, and P sub C. And I just wanna show you what the error would look like if I did this, let it scroll down, oops, one too far. Um, if I had put in 0.6 here, so if you decide to put in the proportion of successes, because maybe you'd already calculated it, if you go through and hit calculate here, it's going to pop back on an error. All right. So with that, I'm going to flip back to my handwritten answers uh, now that I've got my calculator screen to help me. All right. See you in a bit. Bye. All right. To review up what we just did on our calculator, let's try this together. So we're going to go stat. I'm going to go over to tests. This time I'm at two sample proportion z-test because I am in prop land, I'm running a z-test and I have two samples. 
These first four numbers have to be whole numbers. They've got to be integers. So I had 60, remor 60 warts removed out of 100, and then I had 88 warts removed out of 104. I had a less than alternate, and the way my calculator was left, it looks like it is still set at less than. I'll keep that. I'm going to hit calculate, and then I'm going to take this first, or technically second line here, negative 3.938. Eight, and that's going to be my test statistic. Okay, that second line is a p-value, and please don't tell me the p-value is 4.1. Every p-value is a probability, so it's got to be a number between 0 and 1, so it can't be 4.1. We don't want to ignore this e to the negative 5, and e to the negative 5 is scientific notation telling us that the p-value is basically 0.00004, Basically, your p-value is zero, that there's no chance if the null was true, you would see sample data like this just, just through random variation. So in terms of your p-value, you could just write this. That is totally acceptable, and I, I imagine most of you are going to do that, and that's great. But I also want to go over how we could get it using normal CDF, because I will put multiple choice questions in your quizzes and on different assessments to see if you know how to get from step 10 to step 11 just on its own. And every time you want to build from step 10 to step 11, you need a CDF, whether that's normal CDF, TCDF, chi-squared CDF, or FCDF when we get there. So let's pretend that we knew this number, but we didn't have our calculator's output screen to help us with step 11 just yet. So p-values are always a probability. You owe me a letter a symbol, and a number. All right, so the letter we're going to use is going to be the z's. We knew that from our z distribution. If we look at our alternate, which you can't quite see here, but we had a less than alternate, so I'm going to put the less than symbol here, and then I had negative 3.938. Oops, I'm going to run out of room again. All right, so if I want that area, I'm going to hit normal CDF, Right, we're going to go low, high, mean, standard deviation, and let me crunch that number, and I want you to see how similar it is to this calculator output. Right, so let's remember it was 4.1 times 10 to the negative fifth. So if I go to normal CDF and type in negative infinity to negative 3.938, comma 0, comma 1, you see that I'm getting something pretty darn close, right? We're, we're off by thousandths or ten thousandths of decimals. So this is zero. All right, so keep in mind, whenever you want to build from step 10 to 11, it always involves a CDF. It's either normal, T, chi-squared, or F. And in chapters 8 and 9, well, chapters 9 and 10, it's T CDF or normal CDF. All right, I'm also going to use my calculator to draw this. But you can imagine if I have zero area under a curve, I'm going to be shading zero area under this curve. So let me go draw my, my standard normal curve. Something like that. All right, so I know that I've got uh, a Z curve here, we've got zero under the peak. My test statistic was about, it's over here somewhere. Let me actually extend my Z axis just a bit. It'll be somewhere like here. So negative 3.938. There is zero area to the left. That's why my P value is zero. All right, and it's decision time. So let's see what we're going to decide. All right, so our p-value was zero. That is less than our alpha of 1%, so we're gonna reject H0 and say we have sufficient evidence for the alternate. All right, so let's, let's write this up. All right, so because our p-value is less than alpha, we reject H0. So we have sufficient evidence 
And let's talk about options you have here. So I, I, I wanna, I'm gonna scooch back up so we can see our original alternate and our setup, but I wanna talk about options that you have. All right, so let's go back to where this whole thing started. So we could say we have sufficient evidence of the alternate. We could say we have sufficient evidence that P1 is less than P2, but we're gonna say we have sufficient evidence that the true proportion of warts successfully removed by freezing is less than the true proportion of warts successfully removed by duct tape. Totally acceptable sentence, right? So you could actually write out your alternate in words. You could also say we have sufficient evidence that freezing is less successful than duct tape in removing warts. So I think it's easier typically for students to just take the words, take the phrase that was presented to you and repeat it back to me so that you don't have to come up with your own phrase. It's still good practice to come up with your own phrase, but I want you to see that you could say we have sufficient evidence that freezing is less successful than duct tape in removing warts. Okay, so I'm gonna write that up. Okay, so we have sufficient evidence that freezing is less successful than duct tape in removing warts. All right, so totally acceptable answer. I'm gonna try and squeeze the other version in here. So if you wanted to go with the longer version, and you're more than welcome to practice it, you could say, I hope I have room to write this, we have sufficient evidence that the true proportion of warts successfully removed by freezing is less than the proportion of warts, and I'm barely going to be able to squeeze this in here, successfully removed by duct tape. Alright, so either answer, totally acceptable. I, I personally go with the, uh, I take whatever words are presented to me when I'm running a hypothesis test and just give them right back to my evaluator. All right. So that's our first uh, hypothesis test with two samples and we're in proportion land. We're gonna go now try it in mean land. See you in a bit, bye.